Thanks a lot, Anthony, for that um, really gracious introduction. Uh, I also want to thank the philosopher for hosting this and uh, giving me the chance to really spend some time chewing on this latest work of Lewis's. Um, I've gotten to, you know, since I was an undergraduate, actually, um, gotten to read uh, work of Professor Gordon's um, and got to participate in the Caribbean uh, philosophy summer school, which is something Gordon helped organize. So I'm really happy to get this opportunity to talk a bit about uh, his work face to face. Um, Lewis, is there anything you want to say before I start peppering you with questions? Sure. What I'd like to begin with is um, first in an ancient East African language, Medinetur, say Hotep. And I'll also say Shalom, Assalamu Alaikum. I know there are people, folks doing Ramadan. Matia Vanigant, a little, a little shout out to my uh, Tamil folks in India. And Dalito, which is uh, Choctaw in the United States for um, one of the indigenous languages here. And Kia. Uh, mainly because, just a little homage to the philosopher, since um, even though the word philosophy today is looked at in the Greek language, its origins, as I point out in the book, is actually in the ancient East African languages, uh, particularly Medinetur. And beyond all that, I know we're going through other waves of the pandemic, so for those of you who have lost loved ones, my condolences. And for those of you who are struggling, I wish you a quick convalescence. And for the rest of us, I wish continued safety and health. Thank you. Um, definitely echo all of those. Um, I wanna ask a couple of questions just to get started. Um, the first one is something that really struck me in chapter two um, of the book, where there's a discussion about um, political responsibility, which is something that for you goes past kind of moral responsibility, certainly past moralism, right? A kind of viewing of your actions as um, opportunities to demonstrate to yourself um, certain moral commitments as opposed to responsibility for what comes afterwards, right? Um, and there's a particular way there's, that you discuss it, there's a particular historical figure that you discuss it under, which is Harriet Bailey. Um, Harriet Bailey was, the, um, was Frederick Douglass's mother and the two of them were separated, which was um, an unfortunately um, common aspect of chattel slavery in the United States. Um, but she was um, enslaved on a plantation 12 miles away from where Frederick Douglass was growing up. And um, in her last years was able to steal away um, when no one was looking and visit her son um, for a few months. And you talk about this as, you talk about this in the same chapter and in connection to this idea of political responsibility. So I wonder if you wouldn't just uh, say a little bit about what the thought was there. Sure, well, thank you for that question, Femi. Uh, I love talking about Aria Bailey. And indeed, the um, it's extraordinary that this woman who passed away after six months of visiting her child had no idea of the reverberating effects of her actions all the way through to our conversation right now. In a way, it connects to an ongoing issue that we talk about in philosophy. Um, when you asked me earlier about any opening remarks, although I talked about the current situation of so many of us in the globe, I, I, I need to give a shout out to the philosopher, particularly I'm talking about the organization, the magazine, and the very idea that it understands fundamentally that philosophy is a public enterprise. We already see the colonial damage done to philosophy with the idea that there are people who treat the idea of public philosophy as not philosophy, which is a sign of the subversion of what philosophy is about. After all, the most enduring allegory in philosophy 
has been Plato's allegory of the cave. Aristocles was his name, but we know him as Plato, broad shoulders. And the whole point of the allegory is to get out of the shadows, to get outside, to get out there, and to deal not only with the question of the epistemic conditions, but the very act of walking out there is also to be in a relationship with truth and reality, and, that's, and those are expressions of freedom. So the idea that contemporary philosophy has a group of professionals who, when they get unshackled, go to the entrance and find the biggest boulder and put it in front and go back down is a testament to the travesty is what happened to philosophy. And this is why sometimes people are shocked when I say most professional philosophers actually don't do philosophy because they're not interested in getting outside. <laughs> they're avoiding the question that philosophy, if it's worth its salt, has to be able to communicate in that public world. It has to be able to speak ultimately uh, in a way that, uh, I don't always agree with him, but I like what Badu said about the philosopher who goes outside and then walks back down and that back and forth, Badu calls politics, right? Mm. And it relates to your question, right? Because if we think philo politics is simply about philosophers talking to philosophers, we've lost sight of what it is to go beyond ourselves in the broader spectrum of how we deal with the, the constitution of power, the institutions of responsibility, the way in which we're dealing ultimately with reality to the form in which we speak to what Frantz Fanon calls le damné de la terre, the damned of the earth. So if we come back to Harriet Bailey, the chapter is called Reimagining Liberations. It's a chapter I actually started reflecting on in South Africa when I keynoted a conference at Wits University. And, the, um, and I love the plurality in liberations Okay, because it's a very relational idea. It's not that you arrive at a liberation, it's an ongoing praxis. But one of the striking issues we deal with today is that there are so many people who want the outcome before the performance. They want guarantees. They want to, they, they would like it to be reduced to an epistemic algorithm through which one ultimately has risk-free action. But that evacuates action of praxis. Praxis is the world of the contingent. It's dialectical. It doesn't have its synthetic conclusion before its performance, before action. And so after a lot of the critical reflections of the chapter, as you know, I talk about shifting the geography of reason. I talk about decolonizing decoloniality. I talk about all kinds of complex issues, but when all said and done, after we've talked, talk, 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 and talking is very important. Many of us forget that most philosophy is actually the communicating. Written philosophy is a tiny fragment of what we do as philosophers. So that means if we reduce philosophy only to those who have written, we have lost sight that much, most philosophy is actually done, conducted, in action. And some people who wouldn't even think of themselves as philosophers are actually part of the production of humanities, right? Love, filiality with sabayat, which is the African term, which became sophia, wisdom. So what was this wisdom Harriet Bailey was imparting, which is your question? Well, one of the things we know is one, this woman had no reason to, to at all except, even expect this child to love her. This child's been kept away from her for six to seven years. Two, she in her actions was in a world that said her point of view, her life didn't matter except as a commodified instrument in the production of wealth for masters. And in those moments when she was there reaching to this child, communicating with this child, she was exemplifying something that I'd love. I love how Nathalie Etoke talks about this in her book, Melancholia Africana. She's a Cameroonian philosopher 
who teaches at, and literary theorist who teaches at the Grad Center at CUNY. She has this concept she calls for slash giving. Because you see the problem with forgiving in the ordinary English usage is the truth is oppressors, dominators actually don't wanna be forgiven because they live in a logic of contractual relations where to be forgiven is to be placed in debt. So they wanna be able to oppress debt free, right? They wanna be able to conduct it without being obligated. And Nathalie has this concept of for slash giving, which could be put given for. And this act of giving, which is what Harriet Bailey was doing, she was giving, but it wasn't narcissistic giving because there was a whole world that did not give her the reproduction of herself, the narcissistic conception of herself in that world because that world said herself was in and of itself not valuable. So she was in this act of love, giving for, but this, this defies the logic of Euro modernity that is premised upon a reductive conception of the human being, capitalism, which says there's reductive self-interest. Why the hell is she giving? In fact, in this entire back and forth, she was a field slave. At sunrise, she is put out into the field and sunset, she comes in, she has barely any nutrition and she carried the little food she had to this starving child. And as you pointed out, she died. So from the point of view of instrumental rationality, reductive logics of how we deal with notions of what's called human nature. And you know, I reject the notion of human nature. She was a conundrum. Her actions made no sense. And so the question I asked was, why did she act? And this is a very important issue for us to deal with today. Because as you pointed out, that child, Frederick Bailey, through her actions was transformed through an act of love because he was moved out of commodity value into the kind of value that love offers, which is the kind of value that Alicia Garza and her, and her sisters in struggle in Black Lives Matter articulated in the tweet Black Lives Matter, which they called the love letter. That woman was saying to that child, your life matters. But the crucial issue, as you pointed out, is I argued the chapter wasn't really about Frederick Douglass. Because even though his life mattered, he could have been a cocky, self-involved, self-interested, narcissistic individual, say my life matters better than other slaves. But when he escaped, he took a risk beyond the bonds of fugitivity. Because you see, the important issue was for him to value being valued by her. In valuing her, it connected him to the damned of the earth and it connected him to fighting against a system that constructs the irreplaceability of human life into the commodification of replaceability and the notion that there are people whose lives don't matter. And so we know for fact that there are people who acted whom we don't know, who set the conditions of possibility for us to be here. The very fact that Anthony who introduced us, they're you and me, and the fact that I'm talking about Natalie Atoke and you and I are talking about Harriet Bailey, that meant that people like Harriet Bailey were the conditions of our possibility. So it turns out the question is, her action could only be understood not only as radical love, the love through of the way Natalie Tokyo talked about for of giving for, but that act is also an act of radical commitment. You see, it's a clue to political action because when you act politically, it's not about what it's in, what's in it for me. When you act politically, it's because of the collective responsibility of us and the us transcends the present. The us includes the ancestors, it includes, includes the descendants 
and includes the conception of life that may be even radically different from us. Every political action ultimately reaches the anonymous. And so ultimately that committed act, which translates into political responsibility, all political responsibility ultimately addresses also the anonymous, even though we ourselves are not anonymous to ourselves. And so that's part of the clue. I was trying to bring it out of the pessimistic, the narrowly rationalistic, the egotistic, and the narcissistic models of society and action to bring out what liberatory action is as political action. And as we know, there are those who try to argue against that meeting of love and politics and radicality in politics. But I argue the fundamental issue of political action is commitment. And this is something I also share with a woman by the name of Asmas Abbas, because she also wrote a book for Lexington Press on the question of political action and love. I want to press more here because this is a theme you return to um, when, you know, so, so you've built the kind of understanding of political action um, and Harriet Bailey shows us one way that that looks like. Um, and in the end of the fourth chapter, you kind of return to the stakes of taking this view on political action um, and you close the chapter with this, with this really, um, I mean, for me, a really moving passage. So I'm just gonna read it uh, so that we can, you know, have it all in our heads. Um, we need to understand the uniqueness of political responsibility, which as the late Iris Marion Young stressed is always about the future. Since I've argued that political life always raises the question of those who are anonymous, the not yet born or arrived, and many among those who have become ancestors, we should understand what it means to fight for what is not about us individually, but instead about what depends on us while transcending us. And then you conclude, the future is never ours, is a love always committed to the life and freedom of others. So that's what's at stake. And, and I found a lot of things moving, as I said before, about that. But one of the things that I found, one, one question that I had is, I feel like this is not just kind of inspiring, but it's also instructive, right? There's an attitude towards how we're supposed to make the political choices that goes beyond just understanding who they affect, which is people that we haven't met, people that haven't been born yet, right? Um, so you counterpose this to narcissism, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the act of choice and the mentality of choice that comes from commitment. Thank you. Well, as you know, in the book, I make a lot of distinctions. I make distinctions between, for instance, liberty and freedom. Okay. And one of the I also make a distinction between substance metaphysics and relational metaphysics. And a lot of um, narcissists, narcissistic philosophical anthropologies are premised upon substance metaphysics because it deals with an identity relation to the self, which deals with the ongoing reproduction of the self. But relational metaphysics always has a form of distinction and negation through which there's a production of relationships. So it's a form of overcoming of the self. There's a, there is what Simone Weil calls a decreation of the ego. Now, as we know with some issues, there are some people who ultimately reduce them to a form of moralistic self-reference in the sense of, for instance, whether I am a moral being, that kind of stuff. But the kind of problems that lead to oppression tend to be problems in which the options available to certain groups of people are limited as opposed to other groups of people. And so part of liberatory practice is to increase the options available through which people can act and live meaningful lives. And that connects to what you're asking. But of course, 
The complicated part, and this is where the relational metaphysics comes in, is that options, we often tend to look at options very reductively. You know, options in a form of reductive materialism or in which there's like a rock, a stone, or a piece of wood, et cetera, physical obstacles. And that elides the importance of social obstacles. And social obstacles are obstacles that connect to the world of meaning, laws, norms, et cetera. And so within that framework, as we begin to expand meaning and transform what those are, those, because they're relational and outward directed, are not simply in spatial terms, but temporal terms. And also, as you notice, I use the concept of multidimensionality, dimensional terms. And I use dimension in a way that transcends the spatial form. So culture for me is dimensional, mind is dimensional, language is dimensional, et cetera, because dimensions, the way I argue in the text, disclose open and function as keys into different relationships with reality. So part of political action is also to transform and expand in very meaningful ways uh, how human beings can live and express not only freedom, but they're intimately and symbiotically linked to the notion of meaningful lives. So this is one of the reasons why, as that chapter is entitled, right? It's entitled The Teleological Suspensions of Political Life. As you know, in my disciplinary decadence argument, disciplinary decadence deals with the, the reductive, reductionism, the idolizing, the closure, the ontological and epistemic locking in that we have with substance-based metaphysics. And this happens at disciplinary and epistemic levels, but it also happens at social levels when we treat a society like a God or we treat an identity like a God, et cetera. If we open, if we transcend, if we're willing to go beyond them for the sake of reality, there's a paradox because the beyond if we're willing to go beyond philosophy, for instance, for the sake of reality, it doesn't mean we eliminate philosophy. It means we reorient it into a different relationship with reality that may produce something new that may include philosophy. Well, it's the same with political life. Political life is not a well-formed formula. It's not a closed system. Political life is open, which means when we're willing to go beyond them, in these actions. That ongoing production, which by the way, I also call power. But, and I agree with not only people such as Foucault, I mean, I'm critical of Foucault in many places, but, I, but I'm critical of the Eurocentric reductionistic hegemonic view of Foucault. Because as you see in the book, I point out that a lot of his arguments were articulated in ancient East Africa in a more fluid, open question of how power actually produces, right? Power is not simply the coercive dominating closure of reality, but power defined as the ability to make things happen with the conditions of doing so. These conditions are multitudinous and they include, for instance, love, action, and also this question of understanding what it is to be the condition. In other words, when we make ourselves into conditions of possibility for what is to come, which pulls us full circle back to Harriet Bailey and many people like her. If we can understand ourselves while we face what looks like the futility of our times, when we face looking at a world in which it seems like our actions don't matter, we have to understand that we don't have advanced knowledge of the implications of our actions which is why I, I, throughout the book, return to that concept of political commitment. Because the commitment is expressed in the action that becomes a condition of possibility through which others can look back. And like Frederick Douglass, be able to say, thank God my mother acted. I think that, 
I, I want to ask one more question before um, I go to the Q&A, because the, the way that you brought Harriet Bailey back in made me think of a kind of thread through the last half or so of the book that gets represented in the discussion between, um, in the discussion where you discuss Césaire and Fanon, right? So a part of Euro modernity is um, whatever else it is includes the kind of this depiction of European particularity as the space of the universe, right? And that's always been a bad thing. It has always come with death and destruction um, as kind of material expressions of that ideology. Um, there's one kind of response to that, which you um, reject, which is in the chapter on Afro-pessimism. Um, but nevertheless, the response that you opt for takes seriously things that we might associate with pessimism. So um, the uh, potential destruction of human life and society. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a bit about the kind of orientation towards the future, the kind of orientation towards contingency, the kind of orientation towards possibility that exceeds us and exceeds what we can predict um, that Harriet Bailey has that allows you to look at death, um, destruction, um, the possibility of collapse in a different way than perhaps some others do. And I sense it's related to your discussion earlier in the book about quasi do and other ways that we can um, learn from each other other than subsuming one group's framework into another, um, but, but that may be a misreading. It's not a misreading. As you know, it, one of the reasons I brought up relational metaphysics is because I talk about the interconnectedness of what we do. But the thing to bear in mind is, if we return to my opening remark also about the enduring quality of the allegory of the cave, or if we think about people such as Antef. Antef I talk about in the book in the first chapter, who is you know, um, an ancient African philosopher from 4,000 years ago. And I talk about this in my critique, for instance, of the tendency to reduce philosophy to something that Greek speaking people did exclusively by pointing out 2000, nearly 2000 years of philosophy before there was an Athens. But in addition to that, I also talk against the concepts such as, for instance, modernity. I was glad you said Euro modernity, because there's a tendency to confuse the modern and modernity with the European. But the point to which you're, 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 you're um, on which you're focusing is a profoundly existential point. I'm very explicit in the book that optimism and pessimism are two sides of the same coin because they both require forecast. And they both require us to, to say and predict and do kinds of things that just absolutely we don't have access to. So why I brought up the allegory of the cave, Antef and others, is because ultimately, and that point I made even earlier about why philosophy must be public, is because philosophy fundamentally is about reality. And one of the things that's enduring, particularly from the Africana philosophical tradition, or if we think of black traditions like the blues, is that the blues doesn't shoot a sugarcoat reality. And where I do share something with the pessimists is that they're willing not to shoot sugarcoat reality, right? There's not denial. It's like talking about life without death. It's like talking about going through a day without suffering. And suffering is that intrinsically has, doesn't have to be bad. But here's the thing. The reason ap optimism and pessimism are two sides of the same coin is because they elide the human ability to act on the basis of commitment. What it means to say I'm acting because I must, you see? And that, that question, that ability we have, that ability to
to be committed, to be connected through, and to say, I'm doing this not for me, but an understanding that it needs to be done, whether I succeed or not. That is the sine qua non of liberatory political action. There are a lot of people who don't understand that a lot of those revolutionaries today who are looked at as martyrs loved life. They weren't interested in being martyrs, but they were committed to the action. Right now, I was at a meeting on Rosa Luxemburg. She acted. Frantz Fanon, Patrice Lumumba. We could go through the long list all the way through Paul Bogle in Jamaica. We can go all the way through to people such as Lucy Parsons. The list is long. But that is the, that is the thing, you see? We don't wanna be stuck into an endless debate between optimism and pessimism that result in impeding our capacity to act. And it doesn't mean that we act irrationally because as you know, in the book, I make a distinction between reason and rationality. The thing about reason is that reason has to be able to evaluate actions, but the thing about reason is that reason is never complete. So this question then of the kind of virtues of action, this is one of the reasons why in the book I was very, I, I, I was determined not only not to sugarcoat reality, but also you may notice that the book ends in a dialogue because Throughout the book, I'm critical of the idea of the intellectual or the philosopher functioning like Moses with the tablets. So I needed to end the book through a, an actual practice of humility dialogically. And that dialogical relationship is also there in terms of how we deal with commitment to those to come. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pivot to questions. Carolina Sanchez asks um, if you could clarify what you mean when you say that you reject human nature. Abs sure. Uh, you may also notice in the book, I'm critical of ontology. There are people who have read some of my early writings and think that I argue that the black is ontological and all of that stuff. And no, I argue that what racism does is try to make the black ontological through trying to construct the white as an ontological notion of supremacy. Well, the thing about existence, and if you look at its etymology, existera, to stand out, the human, the, the world, the understanding of us relationally, consciously, is that we're a bit of a conundrum. Because you see, from a purely ontological standpoint, um, and I mean that in a, in a cheeky way, um, we didn't have to exist. Being is perfectly fine by itself, all right? It's in an identity one-to-one -one relation with itself. But existence is to stand out from being. The moment you stand out from being, you can raise the question of being in a way that is always making you other than the being. Nature, human nature arguments are arguments premised upon trying to squeeze human reality back into being. And I agree with people like Kaiji Nishitani that the problem with ontology is it covers reality. Reality is greater than being, it transcends being. The thing about human nature, if we make it concrete, is that human nature would require a causal mechanism behind our action in such a way that eliminates our freedom in our action. The thing about that, about human reality, is that you could put what we call human beings, and again, we use the term human being, but I argue a human being is not properly a being. When we put human beings, and I put that in scare quotes, into situations, you cannot have the in advance outcome of what a human being will do 
because human beings live in the sphere of meaning, culture, etc. And those bring a fundamental ambiguity to what action would entail, etc. Sometimes to my students, I put it this way. If you throw an animal in front of a starving human being, right, a tied up animal, you cannot predict the outcome. Some human beings may kill the animal and eat it. Other human beings may say, no, I will stick to being a vegan. Other human beings may say, although I am a vegan, I'll eat the animal. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. In other words, once you get into the realm of human reality, you're dealing with the mediating condition of meaning that raises the question of responsibility for the action. And that obliterates the way, human, the, the way nature will function. If a crocodile doesn't eat the animal, your response is that's a sick crocodile. What's wrong with the crocodile? You're not going to look for the question of whether the, 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 the crocodile decided to become a Zen Buddhist. But the human being who doesn't eat the animal is not necessarily a sick human being. And you could put in other, uh, this is one of the reasons why within the sphere of human reality, you cannot use the notion of your nature as an excuse for your action of committing harm on another. Responsibility is part of the human condition precisely because freedom is part of the human condition. And you notice I said condition, not nature. So I hope that's short, there's a longer version of that, but I hope that short version gives some insight into why I reject the notion of human nature. I don't reject the notion of human conditions. I don't reject the notion of behavior. I don't reject the notion that human beings, for instance, are terrestrial key creatures with bio, biophysical you know, features. But all those are our conditions. But what human reality is about is always the more than that. So a number of people have asked about um, the term decolonizing or decoloniality. Um, one person points out um, colonization came from the elite and imposed itself on the people, but can decolonization happen without the agency of the masses? That is only as a product of political struggle of the people, not merely of intellectuals. We, are, we hear of decolonization of curriculum in which uh, the dames de terre have little or no say. Please expand on your understanding of decolonization. Thank you, many of you who asked that question. In a way, we've been talking about this from the moment I said the word public philosophy, right? The, the public element of philosophy. The first part is, first I'll give you the standard position, right? What the decolonial theorists argue, okay? The decolonial theorists argue that when you fight against formal colonization, that's an act of decolonization. But the thing is that uh, colonization also has uh, uh, an additional element. It has epistemic, it has social elements that they call coloniality. So even though you may have decolonization, if you don't, you need to develop a specific kind of praxis to deal with coloniality. You can have decolonization and have coloniality remain. And so the decolonial theorists, all the way from Keanu through to Maria Lagones, through to Nelson Maldonado Torres, all the way through to Catherine Walsh, Walter Mignolo, many others, argue that you need a specific practice and they call that decoloniality. Now, there are critics of that. For instance, Boaventura de Souza points out that decoloniality is, and coloniality are ways of referring to what used to be called neocolonialism. And so one needs a praxis against neocolonialism. And one could point out in Fanon, for instance, that Fanon pointed out that although you could have national independence, you could still have the logic of the very system that maintain the colonial structures. And that then means the new generation is actually dealing with the liberators as the producers of neocolonialism or coloniality. And Fanon points it out in a very beautiful way. Fanon points out that at the moment of independence, 
a lot of the people, what the people want to do more than anything is to live freely as in the present, to be, in other words, their version of modern. This is why all over the world, whether it's in different countries of Africa, you can have localized forms of pizza to hip hop, to jazz, to whatever else, right? We already know what Senegalese jazz or, you know, Ghanaian jazz or, you know, Nigerian jazz or South African jazz or hip hop sound like. When you go to Jamaica, you better put some scotch bonnet pepper on that pizza, okay? So we already know that. But what's strange is they make all these changes. But if you look at the institutions of power, they remain intact. And what are the institutions of power? The education system, often the hegemonic notions of religion, the ordering of, of um, governing institutions, the economy. And, they, and you could even go further into the architectural structure of power, the metro, you know, the, the, the capital city versus the rural, that stuff. And Fanon's art critique was, why don't the people understand that if you have those intact, you may have changed the players but not the game. Decoloniality is about changing the game, okay? But if we're gonna change the game, now we're gonna to have to deal with certain other issues. For instance, university is an example. University is a colonial concept. It's, it's a concept that came out of Bologna, Italy. And it's, it's a concept, uni, one, premised on the idea like the Highlander series, there can only be one, and you eliminate all the others. But it also leads to a rewriting of history that eliminates the understanding of whole communities of human, humanity from agents of history. The fact of the matter is there have always been institutions of higher learning. They're, 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 they're more than five, four to 5,000 years old. But they were not premised upon the idea of colonial administration and the whole grammar and logic of how to produce knowledge linked into a way that constantly affirm a hierarchy of individuals as knowledge producers. So one of the things if we're gonna be, what's pretty clear is that there's a form of radicality in, de, in, in the kind of decolonization I'm talking about, okay? And this praxis is absolutely, as the questioners ask, it's linked to radical democracy. It's linked to the idea that this is not about a top-down from the elites model. It's actually about a form of humility in which there's an interactivity in the production and understanding of knowledge. For instance, even the way I think of a researcher and a professor is not the classic model, that's a top-down model. All for me, a researcher, an educator, a philosopher, myself or you or others are, all we are are students. We're just students who fell in love with a particular area of studying and continue to study it. So we're students who are advanced students, but it doesn't follow that others who are willing to learn and participating in it cannot do so. And it doesn't follow that the experiences they bring to it are illegitimate because they're not identical with our own. In other words, we have something to learn from those who are at the supposed bottom. We learn together. That is what a decolonial practice would be if we think about an educational institution. When many people are talking about decolonizing the university, they're still often locked into the logic of trying to keep the university's grammar intact, just changing the players in between, changing the curriculum in between, just adding, adding, adding. But they don't understand that that is back into that problematic metaphysics I talked about. And I'll give you an example. Let's pick women as an example. The old metaphysics and the old liberal, um, um, classical liberal model and when I'm using liberal in the philosophical sense, basically says the system is intrinsically just, it's just that it's been administered unjustly. So to make it just, you correct it 
and you bring women in. You got it? What that system never asked is whether its actual grammar was designed for the exclusion of women, which means that in order to function, anyone who functions in it functions as a male or as a man. That means that anatomical women are brought in in a function that in which they function as normative men, you see? But you see, that's based on a problematic metaphysics that looks at like the way I hold up this glass as if it can be a being unto itself. But as I hold up this glass, if we think in a different way, what I just did was not just about this glass. This glass was also an example. In fact, there are many meanings of this glass from example to weapon to a source of hydration, <laughs> you see? So if we understand a woman or many other identities, not as things, but as relationships, then any relationship entering another relationship is a transformation of the relationship. So that means if a woman is supposed to be part of that system, that system has to change. It's not simply about keeping the system and putting her in. It's about creating a different system. So decolonization, the way I argue about it, where it is a practice of having a relationship with reality that produces in the, in the process freedom as the openness of relations that produce new kinds of relations. And that's exactly what Franz Fanon argued at the end of Le Dagne de la Terre. He says, you have to build new concepts. And he says, set a foot. You know, it's the practice oriented element of it. So those practices, this is the same thing we're dealing with today. There are many people look at you and me and they say they want a black philosopher, but what they really mean is they want a white philosopher in black skin. They gotta understand that if we are going to be dealing with the process of exclusion, it's not simply about putting us in, it's about changing the very practices and opening up the possibilities through which philosophy can begin to become better than itself. And that's a paradoxical statement because as you know, the teleological suspension of philosophy is philosophy beyond philosophy. And so, yes, ultimately this is about a radical democratic practice of the transformation and opening up of the possibilities of human potential. And of course, that may also mean the transformation of what we understand of what a human being is in the terms we have today. Because already we are seeing this happening. Right now, there are different kinds of people we call human being produced who are challenging the old more norms, ranging from how trans humanity is thinking of it, all the way through to the way we are thinking about what may happen if we rethink our institutional and political relations. They all develop new kinds of relationship. We have to look at, if we begin to think of ourselves dialectically as relationships, then we begin to understand that we're always in our actions affecting things and are part of something other than ourselves. I think one of the questions that's in the uh, Q&A list follows up nicely on that last point. Um, so uh, Remy Clement asks, uh, thanks for your explanation of the importance of action in philosophy and in subversive struggles in the world. My question, in the perspective of transformative change, what do you think is the role of consciousness in that process? Class consciousness, for example, and also individual consciousness of what and who we are within history. In order to not be pessimistic, can consciousness be a sharp weapon against the hegemony of the ideology? Well, already you, you know that I look at consciousness relationally, okay? Consciousness is never by itself. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, yeah, I've already argued that I reject both pessimism and optimism, okay? It's a lot like the example of how you climb a mountain. The, the easy, the, the, what, what really makes it difficult to climb a, mount, climb a mountain is to keep looking at the top. You gotta to pay attention to what's in front of you, each step. 
You got to forget you're climbing a mountain. And in fact, after a while, you have to understand that along the way, there are all these things you would miss if you keep looking at the top of the mountain. You'll miss the journey. And in fact, a lot of human reality, a lot of life, even the way we think of language, you brought up Kwasi Weirudo earlier. What I love about Kwasi Weirudo is the way he looks at language. Because he doesn't look at language, you know, too many people study language as if people, as if a language is the exclusive domain of researchers and professors. As if every time we speak, it's all about a, a, an end goal. But a lot of language is just an ongoing sociality of life. A lot of language, there are times when people are telling the truth when they say, when you say, what are you talking about? And they say nothing. Because part of how we're actually able to be in relations or to be conscious is that ongoing participation in language and discursive practices. Now, the question of consciousness, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book, Fear of Black Consciousness, is because you see, uh, there are models of consciousness that are disembodied, that's highly problematic, but there are also versions of consciousness that are, um, are locked in a failure to see the intercommunicative sociality of consciousness, how we're affected by each other, in other words. And when I talk about Black consciousness, I talk about Black consciousness fundamentally as a consciousness that's linked to political reality. You see, if we pick racism as an example, racism uh, ultimately depends on blocking us from setting the conditions for the irrelevance of racists. The relevance of racists tend to moralize the discussion of racism. And before you know it, we're so busy trying to save racist souls that we do nothing about racism. But you see, if you don't want to talk about racism, you now have to be in a, have consciousness of a phenomenon. And that phenomenon is the productive capacity of power. This is why in, race, in an anti-Black racist society, there's such a fear of Black power. And the reason is because if there is Black power, it means that Black people would have the ability with access to the conditions of getting rid of racism, of actually doing something about our lives. But political power is about institutions, it's about practices of citizenship. It's about the ability to make effective decisions on how the world is constituted and transformed. And this is why all racist societies devote a lot of energy to disenfranchisement, to illiteracy, to creating all the mechanisms to erode away the capacity to act and transform. Right now, this is what's happening in the United States and Georgia and across the country, actually, in many states, the Republican Party, as an example, depends upon the disempowerment of people, particularly indigenous and black peoples. So consciousness comes to the heart of it. All racisms, all oppressions, all forms of degradation of human beings rely on disempowerment. And what consciousness is here is about understanding also the mechanisms of power for empowerment. Because it makes no sense to say you're fighting against racism if you're, going to, if you're going to avoid getting rid of the conditions of disempowerment. The misanthropic systems, all systems of oppression have in place mechanisms of institutions to block the options through which people can act. So yes, consciousness raising is there, but here's the thing. The point is the way I talked about that mountain. You don't know at the moment. That's why I focus so much in commitment because we see time and time again. And this requires, you may notice in the book, 
because uh, Femi has read the, read the book, My Analysis of Failure, because this also connects to the questioner's point. From the egotistic self-interested model, failure is very self-referential, right? Harriet Bailey would have to go home saying, I failed. Martin Luther King Jr. would have to have died saying, I failed. El Malik Al Shabazz or Malcolm X would have to die saying, I failed. Fanon would have to die saying, I could go on with the list. But none of these people failed. Because you see, and this is not an optimistic point, it's a critique of how we understand action. Because we tend to lock action at an individual level. We don't understand a political reality is the connection of actions over time. So those actions were conditions of possibilities for other actions. The only reason when I give that example, for instance, of a woman in institutions that historically excluded women, or the fact that you and I are here, is precisely because of those people's actions that set the conditions of possibility for us to be here. And so the, the understanding here is not about success or failure. It's about the ongoing commitment to the actions to be done. I love to give an example um, when I'm dealing with remote meetings like this by talking about, for instance, how our consciousness and language is manifested and how we talk about social distance versus physical distance. Neoliberalism wants us to be socially distant because if we're socially distant, we're isolated and we're vulnerable. But the truth is we're supposed to be physically distant, but we can be socially close because we're using the technologies of communication to be socially close. And as you already know, you can be physically close, but socially distant because you don't get along with each other. There are a lot of physically close, but socially distant marriages. But the conditions of possibility for this social close closeness that we're all having in this forum right now were from three individuals who may have thought that their actions didn't matter, it didn't matter and they had no reason to even to know that they would be connected to us. And I love to give their names. One, his name was Latimer. The other one, her name was Lovelace, Ada Lovelace. The third, her name was Lamar, Hattie Lamar. Now, what did the three of them have to do with us? The first was a black man who developed the filament. We think of Thomas Edison, but no, he worked for Edison. There are a lot of white inventors who owned the patents, but a lot of black people who invented the inventions. Right, the filament enables us to see each other. Ada Lovelace developed the algorithm for the computer. We're all on computers. She had no idea of knowing that it would lead to us. Ada Lamar, she dealt with the wireless technology that trans transformed Tesla's inventions and Fermi's into what we can have as the wireless internet. The internet's been around a long time, but the technology through which it transformed it, that's connected to them. You see where I'm going with this, right? And so, it will be incorrect to say any of those people fail, but it'll be incorrect to talk about their success in terms of the things that they could never have imagined of what to do with what they developed. And a lot of what we're doing today, we have no reason to know. In other words, we have to rethink action out of the my individual stuff. Even like when I think about my books, right? I said the word my books, but actually I look at, I don't consider things I write as complete. I consider things I write as learning efforts through which I am, have exhausted uh, how I'm working on it in a way that as a public document, it's what others are bringing to it so I could continue learning from them. You see the difference? Even the way we're talking about the, that book I wrote there, Nelson Maldonado Torres was my student. But there are things I learned from my student that affected the way I thought Africana philosophy through the way I do it today that connects it to decoloni decolonization, decoloniality, and other areas of research. You see where I'm getting at? And, and, and God knows what so many other people, what I learned from Catherine Walsh, what I learned from Julia Suarez Crabe, what I learned from people, what I learned from, I had no idea these things would put me 
at all in conversation with part of a community of action from, for instance, the Dalit poet, Sandra Mahan S. And the list goes on and on. What that brings forth is that it's not about me. So in, in other words, in the very praxis, we need to understand that political action is always about us over time. And the commitment to those actions, if those people had given up, those actions wouldn't have continued over time. And, they're, they're, and, they're, and it's not to say all actions that continue over time are good. We're dealing with the repercussions of fascism, the seeds sown. These are dialectical, they're in conflict. But as we're dealing with everything from oppression to enslavement, to, to, to practices of genocide, no individual unless a God can transform them. And so we need to rethink action as something that's an ongoing participation of communities over time. This book is basically part of a community and anything, anything I've ever written and anything others have written, they're part of what I call the subjunctive space. The subjunctive space is what enables us to be in a conversation with Antef, Hepshet, Hotep, Plato, Lao Tzu, Swanza, Arabindo, Nishitani, the list goes on. Okay? <laughs>